Welcome back to the next episode of interviews. How does it feel to be a classical female musician? Where we talk about careers, challenges of being a woman in classical music business and general gender inequality in this industry. It is a series of interviews with prominent female musicians. You can find out more about the project in the description below. I'm very happy to introduce you my today co-speaker, Evanina Kosmos, an amazing Slovenian flutist working and living in France. Hello, Nina. Hi, nice to be here. <laughs> uh, you are the only Slovenian musician who ever won the prestigious Eurovision competition for young musicians in 2010. I assume that was one of the biggest milestones in your career, which opened many doors. As a soloist, you performed with radio orchestras of Slovenia, Vienna and Bucharest, Chamber Orchestra of Zagreb, Solist, and others. How was the entrance to the professional world for you as a young, successful, and attractive woman? Well, it, it was a bit complicated in the beginning because when this competition took place, I was 16. And um, as you said, actually, that, that was kind of the milestone for like the opening of many doors for my future which was an amazing opportunity, of course. But at the same time, at 16, you're not completely prepared for everything that is going to come your way. Um, and especially as a woman, uh, as a soloist, especially also when, when you are a small woman, it's maybe even <laughs> harder in a way because I am not very tall and I looked very young then and I still do look very young sometimes. Um, it makes it a little bit more difficult for people to respect you, especially if you come in a role as a soloist in front of a big orchestra of professional musicians who have been doing this for 40 years, some of them, <laughs> and you are still young, a little bit inexperienced, just very, very happy to be there and to play. Um, but at the same time, you have to take some kind of attitude and confidence that you have to sometimes act a little bit that you don't have yet but have to pretend that you have it it's not easy sometimes to be in this role but at the same time it was very um it was an amazing opportunity of course and it opened many doors for me mm. i assume when you went to this competition that of course you you dreamed of a win and wish for it but probably you didn't expected it right yeah no, not you at all. Expect it? <laughs> no. Uh, did you know what is coming with a win if you win actually because I have a feeling when we are younger we want to win but we actually have no idea what this win is bringing like concerts uh, big stages a lot of opportunities but also an adult life which we don't know yet because we are students and I mean, we are kind of babies which are growing up, but still doesn't have this attitude, as you said before. So were you shocked when, when you got a lot of concerts and you met many famous, famous, I mean, famous orchestras and conductors and uh, musicians? Yeah, well, the, the thing for me was that I, I was doing competitions since I was very young and as you said like we do them because it's a part of our education and um of course you always wish to win because it's you have this drive like uh, this motivation and um you do it also because you just love to play and because you love the music and you don't have the you're not so conscious about everything it brings yet like the bad things and the good things of course like all the opportunities you get but then also the pressure that comes with it. And um, yeah, you're not really prepared for that because you don't see it the same way. I feel like when you do auditions and competitions later in life, you know what you're in for, you know also what you want from them. Uh, and when you're younger, you just kind of do them because it's nice to do them, but you don't know what they're gonna bring or... And uh, for me, what was, I mean, of course, I, did, I didn't expect it at all. And I was very, very surprised as there were some video proofs of that somewhere. <laughs> I remember that. I was actually watching the live stream. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and um, 
And also a part of that is also as a woman, for example, a lot of people told me, oh, it was nice because you smiled, but actually my smile was a part of my fear because they come at you with this huge camera just in front of you, just before you go on stage and you don't know how to react. And I was just kind of like, mm -hmm. and this is also sometimes it's like, oh, it's so nice because you smile. And I don't think this is something that one would say to a man also. I don't know. It's um, a very woman thing to say, oh, it's nice that you smile, which is, of course, a huge compliment as well. But then it also can give you pre pressure to be happy all the time, which sometimes you're just not. <laughs> That's just life. <laughs> And uh, what it brought was that I got these invitations to these amazing festivals with uh, amazing musicians who were um, more launched into their careers already, more known and um, also older a lot of the times. And I, in the beginning, it's very hard to find your place in that because you kind of feel like you don't belong or like you that's also maybe a personal problem for me in the beginning that you have to have enough confidence to uh, know that you deserve to be there and in the beginning sometimes it's very hard to uh, own that it's uh, you feel a little bit intimidated by all of these people who already did so much you know yeah and also probably with the people which you admire from before mm -hmm. and you know them and then you are finally there and you need to play with them and I think it's also connected a bit with our mindset and everything, because unfortunately, I got a feeling like when I spoke with my colleagues, for example, male and female, it was very rare that I got from a female musician, like very strong attitude about the quality and everything. I speak when we are younger, of course, mm. but with, with males, it's kind of in common they are very sure about their self and they have also attitude like that which probably helps them later much more and mm -hmm. we need to learn it and I think it's very important that we speak about those things and that young girls are aware that of course it's the most important that they work a lot and they have a quality but they need to be aware of this quality because if you are good and you are too shy Mm. There is more possibility that people won't respect you, as you said before, and that maybe they won't care about your thinking or about your ideas so much as they should. I mean, the young girls should be really aware that if they get the opportunities, um, which are product of a good concert or a good competition or something like that, that they need to have this attitude. I'm good enough to be here. and. Um, to really show that attitude because mm. it's nothing bad with it um, of course not being arrogant or something like that mm. far away mm. um, in last years you also gained some experiences um, in orchestras and you are a solo flutist of opera de Lijon. Limoges. <laughs> Limoges in France. But as a solo flutist, you're also collaborating with many other orchestras as Opera Nationale de Lyon, Concerthaus, Orchester Berlin, Oslo Philharmonic, and many others. Did you ever um, have problems in your career because your appearance? For sure. Um, I think maybe I'm wrong, but I think it happens even more in opera world because i don't know maybe because the productions are longer um and for sure when i was younger especially because with time like what you said before with time you kind of learn to not show your weaknesses to not talk about your self-doubt or because the society still kind of teaches uh, women uh, that being sure of yourself is sometimes connected to being arrogant and it's not uh, supposed to be so um, but we still feel very quickly I mean I don't want to generalize of course but I, I think like you said women still feel much quicker that they are arrogant if just they show a bit of confidence uh, and we feel judged uh, for that as well and I felt judged in the beginning of my career in the orchestra because I would speak freely and I would also express myself that sometimes, uh, which is not always um, 
so well accepted when you're in a, in a soloist uh, position in a, as a flute solo in an orchestra and especially in invited flute solo you're supposed to arrive and be sure of yourself like from the first rehearsal on um, because it's also something they expect from you to be a leader but I still have some somehow think it's easier to accept a man as a leader <laughs> uh, it's like when you're a woman and you arrive and you're one meter 56 as I am uh, or a man who is like two meters and you know is already the first impression is maybe not completely the same and uh, I did deal with that and I also um, had a few conductors who were very openly <laughs> uh, horrible with women on solo positions um, which I, at the time I was still very naive, kind of, I thought, uh, no, but this is a different era, things are changing, it's much better, and, and then you have a production when this conductor is basically screaming at you and at your female uh, um, colleagues uh, um, for nothing, sometimes even when I wasn't playing, so it wasn't even really connected to that. <laughs> And it can be very tough it's, um, because there's a position of power, of course, uh, authority. This is very hard to uh, navigate. And sometimes when you're an invited player or when you're on a trial or something, it can be very hard to deal with that because you don't know how to react in the moment. You want to say something, but at the same time, can you say something without being perceived as it's, yeah. Uh, I had, I had also, I was lucky because my colleagues helped me in this kind of situation. I just situations. wanted to ask you, um, I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that uh, things like that happened also to you, unfortunately, but I wanted to help you. How did your colleagues react? Well, most of my colleagues, actually, um, my closer colleagues, they got very angry, some of them. <laughs> um, uh, they did uh, uh, like a movement within the orchestra also that uh, helped for this uh, conductor in, in particular not to be invited again, for example. So I did feel support. Sometimes you don't feel support so much because the people are a little bit detached from everything that's happening and you're just supposed to be strong enough to deal with it. But yeah, these kind of things happen, unfortunately, uh, still quite often. Um, now I don't react the same way. Um, it would not hurt me so much now, for example. It would not touch me so deeply because at the time when this was, I don't know, I was maybe 19, 20, I wasn't sure of myself enough yet to be like, oh, but it's not my problem, it's his problem. You start to self-doubt like very quickly. And it, of course it helps when your colleagues are uh, supportive but it's not always uh, the case or so sometimes they try to be but it's not enough it's not what you need yeah okay yeah that are really <laughs> tough themes and actually i have a feeling that many people actually have a feeling that um, gender gender inequality in music shouldn't be a theme anymore because they think everything is more or less good but um, when we just look to the orchestras in general, we see that really mostly of solo positions still have men. Of course, it depends from the instrument. For example, harp, there is no, I mean, much more uh, female musicians. And also in flute in general, it's more female musicians, but still I have a feeling that at the end, um, there is on leading positions still quite a lot of uh, male uh, persons. But I would like to ask you, do you do you have your kind of opinion about why we still in the orchestras have so many male uh, solo positions? Even on the auditions, I have a feeling that for orchestras, it's really hard to decide to take a young woman as a, I don't know, solo second violin or solo cello. There are, of mm. course, if we just look at that 50, 60 years ago, it was extremely hard to get to the orchestra as a woman. We did a huge, huge, huge development. But as many people think that now is everything um, in Ordnung, um, mm. I, 
I think it's still important to speak about it and to make people aware that we still struggle from the problems which was before. Yes, I, I, I agree. I think we made a lot of progress, of course, and there I actually know a lot of orchestras who would privilege a woman. Uh, if it was like a tie between a man and, and a woman, they would mm -hmm. privilege women, um, which can also be up for debate, you know, but I think uh, it's very important to go in the other direction now because we're still not completely in the... Uh, equal position um, gender-wise. Yeah, I, I don't know what exactly is the reason. I know the, the questions I asked myself, for example. I even thought through sometimes if I should maybe dress differently or um, appear a little bit older or a little bit more like in authority because it, some women I know, they went in a different direction. They started to dress more uh, strictly so that they would appear more as an authority figure. The others tried to dress more feminine so that they that can also work in another way. Um, I don't know if there's actually a reason behind. Um, I think it's just this, the way society works and it's been centuries. And we are working on it, but it's still not completely, um, it's, the work is not done yet because the women are not perceived the same way still. Like I, I actually got a comment once in an audition. Oh, but you're still so young. You have so much time uh, and you're a woman and for a leader, leading position. And, and I was like, I'm actually not so young. I was 25. And this was of course coming from a guy. <laughs> It's hard. It's like, and if you dress too feminine or too revealing, or then uh, your career can get can get boosted as well. But then you're also judged for it. So I think everybody should be able to dress and be the way they want and be judged the same way. But it's not as obvious it it seems. Exactly. I I um, since I started with this project, I tried to speak with as many. Um, female um, colleagues as possible, um, also like solists and people who are in the orchestras longer time. And from young women, mostly I heard that when they won the position and they started with the trail time, they changed the way they dress because they didn't want to be seen too much or judged or something. So they mm -hmm. wanted to took like darker colors or they just had different uh, clothes for the job and for later, which is kind of also normal. But then we spoke and we said, okay, but it's not normal that I don't dress a uh, flower dress, um, which is like long enough and everything, if I like it, just because I'm afraid I will be too much seen or yellow mm -hmm. t-shirt or something like that. And then with older colleagues, I saw that they said that it's kind of normal because we all think like that. Um, but that later you just see that you need to be who you are. And unfortunately, it seems like uh, being smart if you the first trail period really try to not be so much seen. Just that you won't, wouldn't get too much attention and too much comments because that can actually make more bad things in the trail time, as I heard, than than good things but mm -hmm. unfortunately i think it's kind of it shouldn't be acceptable because i never heard that someone commented what a man wear to the rehearsal like mm -hmm. and of course i don't think that we should come to the rehearsal in a short um, short dresses or something like that of course we all know what is kind of acceptable for classical musicians and for the orchestra and everything but um colors and dresses and things like that i think that should be really our our possibility to to wear what we want and for example i also heard one one very shocking story for me and it was um there was a girl on the audition for the orchestra um and the comments she got was you were amazing, you play, play really, really good, but we can't take you because you are too beautiful and we are afraid that audience would take too much attention of your look and not to our music. And that was their 
comment why she didn't got the the position <sighs> and i think i i was super shocked because yeah this happens like, so much so yeah and sometimes the looks are are the things that can sell also like that's the thing i mean i i think that in first uh, position we i mean we are anyway musicians so we do a music which we want to show to the people and the appearance can be just a bonus which you can have or don't have or want to have or something but it shouldn't be something which takes you the opportunities away because the appearance is also a very discussable theme and of course the beauty is not the same for everyone but i think if it is it should be kind of bonus but not a minus because you you don't choose how you how you look actually i mean you do something about it but you are born the way you are so mm. um but i think if we speak about those things we can at least help girls to be aware that things like that are happening because honestly when i came to study to germany um before this scholarship i i wasn't aware that things like that are happening and then i started to research and i realized we are kind of too far away from for 21st century i would say mm. um and i think conversations like that can at least help to young girls to think about it and to be prepared um and maybe also someone hear it and change their mind about how they react to to the female co uh, colleagues in the orchestra especially the new one um or aushilfe and things like that so um did you ever actually get a feeling it's harder to succeed in the classical music world as a female musician um i think um well you do feel a certain pressure to look good for example i that you don't you don't have this pressure for men so much um you have to dress a certain way you have to be seen a certain way i mean of course some women broke that code as well but um it's still quite rare like most women you have to be very feminine if you want to succeed in a way or at least uh, have a certain um image to you or we um, have opposite thing with conductors they need to dress as much as possible not feministic because otherwise they will be even more judged from their colleagues unfortunately yeah. it's, it's so hard for them to succeed and if you just like kind of try to look how they dress for the concert they mostly dress very similar to the to the male colleagues at least what i saw yes we we i never saw a female conductor in a dress for example <laughs> so yeah so it's a very different um criteria uh, for them than for musicians i think it's even harder for them because it's really an authority figure and for a woman to be perceived as an authority it's um it's much more difficult to for people to respect her uh, from the first moment of course sometimes men as well are not respected from the first moment i've had some of the experiences uh much less in germany much more in france maybe uh that the mm -hmm. conductors really have to learn to earn their respect you know ah, okay um, but uh as a woman it's i think maybe more difficult because you know, as a woman conductor especially because people don't like to follow a woman sometimes i don't know it's it's a society uh, it's the pa patriarchy still going on um but yeah i mean also in a classical music world there are so many different factors that factor in that i even spoke with my male colleagues about um for example if you have tattoos or if you like to dress a certain way or it can be perceived in a bad way when you're in a, a classical musician um and this maybe depends also in a country on a country you're in but sometimes uh, some friends of mine they said oh yeah i will be very careful how i dress for a rehearsal i will hide all of my tattoos if i have a piercing or something i'm gonna hide it because it's better not to be seen like that in a rehearsal 
And I always wanted a tattoo, but I was too afraid because I am coming from a musical family <laughs> and my mom was always like, you can't do it? How mm. will it look on the stage? And I was like, but I wouldn't even show it on the stage. No, 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 you can't do it. You can't mm. do it. So... Yeah. And even if you do, you know, you show it, why, why, why does it have to change anything? It's, or even the color of your hair, like if you dye your hair. Exactly, color. but I just, yeah, but yeah. that's what I got, for example. And I would say my family is pretty open and not so in the box like many, many other um, classical musicians. But still, the two is like something you don't do it because it's really inappropriate. And then I have a friend who who made the tattoo here, like some mm. notes. She don't care about it at all. She say, I wear what I want. Mm. So many times she show it on the concert, but it's true. She don't play in the orchestra. So I don't know. She's like a solist and chamber, mu uh, chamber musician. And I think in the orchestras, the things are even more strict and in the box. Mm -hmm. And it's like kind of almost a rule, just don't go out of the box mm -hmm. because it is how it is. So let's leave it like that. Yeah, for sure. Even more for tutti players uh, than for soloists sometimes. Yeah, yeah and, for sure. Yeah. And these rules they have also, I don't know, about the long sleeves, for example, which I can... In a way, I can understand because it can bring some kind of unity to the orchestra that you may need. But then some of the people, when I asked about it, gave me the reason that it's because the arms are not always beautiful. And I was kind of like, okay, why? In, like female arms are not always beautiful because what? Because there's what? When you grow older, I don't know. And it really shocked me. And I was kind of like, okay, is that the reason? <laughs> I also heard once the reason about it, like, because it doesn't look good on the TV, like with the yeah. radio orchestra. So it's kind of the same, the mm. same reason. So probably there is some truth about it, unfortunately. Mm. But I wanted to ask you, like, did you ever get any question about a family? Like, will you have a family? Do you mm. want to have a family? How much? Because it happens that sometimes, I don't know, someone have four children and then it's seven years not on the job and things like that. Do you, do you have feeling in the, in the orchestra and musician um, world is kind of free of that question or you needed to deal with it? I personally didn't need to deal with it because it wasn't a question for me yet but I mean I know some of the women who already had families and wanted to maybe have more children or something when auditioning for another job it's always a question of oh but are you maybe gonna get pregnant at some point and you know we will have to replace you or you won't be there as much anymore or or even some of my friends who were auditioning pregnant um when it, it can be seen, you know, they ask themselves a question like, oh, but maybe they will not take me because I'm pregnant now. So, um, and the thing with our jobs is that you have some positions that open every 40 years. So if by chance exactly. you're pregnant at that time, you know, you still want to do it, of course, but then you're not seeing perceived the same way, the same way, because they're like, oh, but you're going to start later because then you have to give birth. And of course, this question doesn't come into the picture for men <laughs> yeah but still seems like a pretty good situation at least about this question i would say right i think it really depends it depends of uh, of an orchestra it depends on the situation um i think also maybe we don't talk enough about women's period uh, some women on a period they have really bad periods and they can't function for a day or two and this should be also maybe counted as a sick day, you know, to be able to take leave on that day because you just cannot be able to play. And this sometimes it's not still understood so much. And I think maybe in the family question, I, th I think it's not so bad now, of course, but it really depends, I think, where and in which situation it's done. Actually, I had a very interesting conversation with one of my co-speakers who said that our cycle and our period is our superpower because if you learn to 
live with it, not against it, it can give you so much. She said that she's she get the best ideas in her life, like in the period of period, and that everything changed when she decided that it's okay to lay two days if you can't do, but she's a freelancer, so it's different than in orchestra. But she said, when I realized I don't need to punish myself and say, yeah, you need to work because, I mean, everybody works. Her life changed so good and she started to get so many ideas in mm. this period. And she said, and then I work much more quality later because I just g- gave myself a time which I need. So, mm. I mean, of course, we don't work every time when we have periods. So maybe no. it's also important to, to remember that we are allowed to lay down and to say, okay, maybe I can't do today eight hours of my job. Um, if you are at home and you can do it, like you practice, you do some medicine, things like that. But I can do a, as much as I can and lay down mm-hmm. and get the energy and leave my body to, to, to rest if it needs and then I will have so much more energy and nothing bad will happen if we really take some time for Mm. ourselves if we need it of course Mm. um you are not only an outstanding solist but also a dedicated chamber and orchestra musician you started your musical education in Slovenia and continued it at a national conservatory for music and ballet Lyon What would you expose as the biggest difference between education in those two countries? Oh, well, I don't know if I can completely compare because my education in Slovenia was uh, still kind of on a high school level and in France it was a conservatory level, so um, it wasn't completely the same. Um, I would say maybe the biggest difference is that uh, they give you more freedom in France, uh, especially like theoretically wise. Uh, uh, I do remember <laughs> one particular moment when I, um, we had harmony and we had to harmonize um, a voice. I mean, I, how do you say a voice in English, uh, one voice, yeah, yeah. One, one line. And I did like a standard, you know, harmonization that we do in Slovenia with like four voices and a choir thing and everything and super complicated. And And then the guy was like, oh, okay, well, this is correct. But I just wanted like one chord per one bar, not every note, just like to accompany a nice melody a little bit on the piano. But I wasn't sure searching like for a completely harmonized choir. (laughs) <laughs> and I was like okay so this is actually something I have to learn as well that we don't maybe learn so much in Slovenia you know to be, just be able to simplify things and to also give yourself artistic freedom which I'm not saying that we don't get in Slovenia of course we do but um, but our theoretical education is a little bit stricter which also actually served me well because when I entered um, in the conservatory I was exempt of some of the um classes that i didn't have to do because i passed the the entry exams yeah for me was for example when i compare i studied in so conservatory like you in slovenia and then uh, better and master in croatia and another master in germany and i realized that for example it helped me so much that we had such a strict solfeggio in slovenia but we had it every year so it was okay but harmony we did in two years but for me was pretty um, intense Mm -hmm. and I didn't have a feeling I got I got it a lot for my life I got it more like there because it was so many things and I learned everything I needed but then I when I needed to use it in the real life I couldn't and then I compared it with some other people who maybe had harmony longer period but did it really slow and like you said it was firstly important to do some accompaniment which will pass together with the melody and not maybe exactly the whole core things. Mm. And they could use it in the real life much better, actually. Um, Mm. I don't know, for me was also the difference between um, countries, for example, that in Slovenia we still... um, unfortunately don't have so much foreign students 
also, like mm -hmm. you said, I also didn't study on academy, but um, I kind of know the situation there. And I think one of the best things studying abroad is that you actually also meet so many cultures and mm -hmm. you realize that there are so many different people from which you can learn a lot and which can inspire you. And um, I think that's a really, it's a big treasure which you can take then later in your life. And maybe also when you come to the orchestra or to the different chamber groups, you can understand mm -hmm. people better because we don't think all the same and sometimes it really goes with a culture so that I think also one really big plus about studying abroad mm -hmm. yeah for sure yeah you do you do meet a lot of more people um, from different countries um, yeah this is one maybe in Slovenia it's still not so um, I don't know why, why, what for maybe because also we are a small country we don't have many orchestras so uh, people prefer to go to a country when where they know they will have more opportunities to do academy in an orchestra and in Slovenia. I mean, we do have a lot of orchestras for the size of our country, but the thing is that we are we are quite small. <laughs> so yeah, but if we compare the whole Slovenia and one Berlin, um, yeah, that's true. It's, also also true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I think also Erasmus and everything slowly getting at least Evolving, a bit. Yeah. And I think people don't know that we have so many opportunities also in Slovenia in a way, like to play solo with an orchestra when you study and yeah, that's all, true. all these concerts that uh, in France, for example, don't really have or at least much less. So that's a huge positive point. Yeah. So until now, we have been mostly talking about challenges for a woman in the classical music industry. Are there any other positive experiences about it? And would you say we have maybe some special power? Uh, special woman power? I don't know. We all have different powers. I, I don't know. I think maybe empathy is more of a woman trait, women trait in a way sometimes but it's also because society teaches us this way uh, and now there are a lot of positive sides of course but not specifically to being a woman I would say maybe just in a classical world I had so many great experiences and mostly I have to say I've had really positive experiences I had some bad ones as almost everyone did so I don't know what would the special power be <laughs> Maybe it's a hard uh, question, I would say. <laughs> maybe maybe you just can say we don't have it. It's also okay. I, I think we we as men and, and women we both do have some of special powers, but it's you think we have to be ourselves. You have to we have to try try and trust that by being yourself you will achieve uh, what you want or get to a place where you want to be because. Um, I mean, I now, for example, I say I don't want to change. Like, even if in audition they will tell me something, I will. I'm like, okay, I don't want to necessarily change myself. If it's small things, of course, but if it's like something yeah. very fundamental, you know, you have to be sure enough of who you are to stick to it and believe in yourself. That sounds very heroic, but <laughs> no. But it is at the end. If you won't stick with your ideas and your knowing who you are nobody else can do instead of you so you're mm. the one who needs to be honest to yourself and people actually respect you more for it as well like i noticed when you actually really know who you are and you dare to stand up for yourself as well but sometimes you will meet people who will react badly to it but then who cares about them uh but mostly people will actually react very positively to this i mean it's it's kind of normal when you meet someone who have a strong opinion um, and it's not arrogant of course mm. you get some interest to speak more with this person to, to get to know what she or he wants to say and if someone is very shy you sometimes even don't have energy to try to get the things out of this person so I think it's a good end for this um, podcast <laughs> that we shouldn't be shy and even if we are small in the size we shouldn't <laughs> be small in the power in the energy and in the character of course mm. but they also say a poison in in the small bottles so um, <laughs> yeah, we need to do. be aware that we can do whatever we want even if 
we don't have two meters. <laughs> uh, thank you, Eva, uh, Nina, a lot for this conversation. It was a pleasure to speak with you. And I really hope that we will inspire some girls and show them that the world is maybe not only in flowers, but we are strong enough to fight against and to show that we are worth of having a good positions and good jobs. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me and uh, all, all the best for the future and to all the girls out there, like empower yourselves. <laughs> thank you and the same. Thanks.